I'm joined today by Esther Montmani, and we're going to talk about conscious parenting. Uh, Esther is uh, a founder, a creator of a kind of conscious parenting technique and, and coaching uh, approach that has, I, I personally experienced and is incredible. And today we're going to talk a little bit about sharing and sharing the insights and the background of that technique um, and how to actually uh, apply that, how it actually shows up in the day to day of being with a child. And I also think this this work is kind of um, I mean, kind of this work is amazing because not only is it very relevant if you've got children, but actually I think it illuminates um many things um that are quite kind of profound about ourselves and about uh you know even kind of zen and buddhism and, and spiritual work in general out of this very concrete work with uh being a conscious parent and creating supporting a child to be a conscious child so maybe we could start esther if you could just tell me very very briefly or like you know a few minutes how you came to this like what got you interested in being in developing conscious parenting as a technique what what led you to this hello so for me it was like a big big deep aspiration since i was very young uh, my father and my mother they were both teachers and they were both really like deep engaged in, uh, in education and somehow probably i was transmitted this will and this aspiration and they were completely different one to the other. And I remember being a little young child already investigating how the different ways to educate me were influencing me and others, how my mother did it, how my father did it, what did I like from one, what did I like from the other, what I didn't like. And I was always really like pushing questions in me. That's how I would do it. And I would even do it with my dogs and my neighbor's dogs, like, I know it's not the same, but it's also educating animals, no? And many things I was already, even being very young, uh, trying to understand better how we relate to each other, how do we help or not when we try to love and all these things. How, and for me, the most important was how we give a space to each other to really grow, to really grow and not to really conditionate or to push each other down that sometimes we do it also. And then when I was already young, like 18 years old, I needed, I had a very strong need to understand what a human being needs to really develop from within. And then I started for myself going along. And so just, just can I ask you a question? So in your childhood, you said you already had this, you're both your parents were teachers. Can you remember like one incident or one story that kind of illustrates that as a child, that this kind of, were you saying you were like teaching the neighbor's dogs? Like, can you tell me a little bit, like what, did, what actually, you know, one thing that actually happened or that you remember about that? For example, with the dogs, a, a little dog was coming with us and I had, I was always bringing many dogs because some people didn't have time and I really love dogs and I didn't like them to be alone and tight. So I would ask permission and they would give me permission. Yeah, you can take the dog when you want. Sometimes we were, I was alone on the mountains with five dogs. And I remember one time that one of the dogs was a little puppy and he could not go up the hill. All the other dogs were really fast going up the hill. And I just, I just, sit down i sat down on top of the mountain and just waited that he could go up the the dog was like crying and crying because he thought he couldn't but i was sure he could and i just uh stopped there for 15 minutes until the dog was really willing so strong to come that he came so that was a little example that uh, i didn't go and take the dog and put him up because for me that would create moral dependency. And I wanted him to understand that he was strong enough to do it. That was already with dogs. And then it happened that with the children of my neighborhood, I also liked children. And, and then when they became a little bit older, I would bring them uh, with the bikes to different places and we would get a rope and go down the river. And I had also many experiences like this, like a child would climb a tree and then would say to me, would say to me, oh, I cannot go down the tree. And I would say, yeah, I understand, but you climb up and then you will have to come down. I was a little bit 
more young and maybe not so compassionate, a little bit like stronger than now. But the idea was we are more than we think and we, we will have the opportunity to understand. And those adventures, they still remember. When they meet me on the street now, they're already men with children, but they, they, their eyes still are bright and they remember those experiences like a very important part of their childhood too. So this was already in me, but then when I was 18, I kind of saw it consciously. This is a passion and I really want to understand and develop it. So that's how I went to travel to different cultures. I went to India, I went to South America, I went to Europe, different projects to really grasp more and more what it is that we need to really grow from within to, be, to develop our really potential. And how do we relate to each other in a way that we help each other, that it's true love and not only a condition that kind of transmitting what we already know, but to give a space for something new and more uh, singular from each being. Wow. And maybe just to say, you also, maybe something even around you 18 or when you were younger, you said also that you saw, you looked at how your parents or, or even schooling was affecting you. So what was something that you saw, you, you've talked about how you, you already were really interested in supporting, whether it was animals or, or other children, but also did you see anything for yourself? Um, you know, I guess I also know that often for people, and I can mean it's like no mud, no lotus, that there's some maybe also seeds of suffering that are also a motivator in this kind of seeking for um, for kind of deep answers or deep, deep truths. So in your own life, what had you seen maybe positively or maybe not so positively showing up for you in your childhood or in your teenage years? Yeah, for me, when I went to when I was going to school, uh, I was a happy child and I, I was doing good in a school and the teachers loved me a lot and other children loved me a lot, too. But in my being, it was like very clear that I was not learning very meaningful things for me. Like when I had free time every weekend, every evening after school, all the holidays, I would get my bike, go into four, uh, two other villages, go into the caves, go to the rivers, meet people. And for me, that was the true school. And I was even very young and I would say, I would go to school two days and the rest, I would learn how to live. That for me is much more important. And for me, it was like, in the school, we spent like many hours in the classroom to read a few words that I could read it in half an hour at home what we do in five hours in a school because it's so much like shut up listen and now we change and and for me it was really I, I really felt it was like being in a in a case like in a, a little bit like I could see all, all surrounded by a big fence and that we could yes. not. and for me it was like it's no need it's, it's like if they put us in here I, I just couldn't feel it right uh, for me it was a lot a, a lot more right to to be like speaking with the old people, uh, doing things in the garden. So I accepted it and I enjoyed the most out of it. But for me, the truth is that I was, I remember like something like 10 years old and I said, I would never put my children into a school. And I was not an unhappy child, but for me it was like, if we wanna grow, why do we need to be in a case with fences and, and with all the structure that for me was a waste of time because for me to read the book myself was a lot faster than to be in the class waiting for everyone. It was a lot too, too long for me. So many days, so many hours. So that was my inner experience. And so then when you were 18, um, you, you, you kind of, you, you were, I got to know unconventional or conventional, but you basically went, you went on that, that point, you knew that you wanted to learn more about how to bring up children or how to how to be a teacher at that point did you want to be a teacher or a, a pa or a parenting coach or what you maybe you didn't know but yeah what was your initial path basically what what happened for me my idea was like in my in myself it worked like that if i become a teacher i will have the the paper like the the, the they, they will give me a job in a school and i will have money everything will be easy 
but I won't do what I really want because I know already from uh, my own experience and seeing my father's and my mother's experience too, that school teaching is not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a, a complete different approach that will give us the chance to develop what each of us we are and we are singular and different. And in the school, we, they all do the same. They learn the same in the same speed. There is comparison. There are many things that they do not help us to be ourselves really and to develop our uniqueness. So I said, that's the comfortable part, but maybe I, I'm not gonna learn what I really want to learn and I'm not gonna do what I really wanna do. So I, and I said, but I will be in the system and maybe from in the system, maybe I can change something. And I kind of stopped a little bit and reflected. And then I decided that consciously, I decided that that's the, the path that my parents did. And I saw that you can do very little in a very tiny structure to bring something very white. That was my idea that, that what I wanna bring is too new for this old structure. So in that moment, I decided that even it's gonna be maybe the hardest path and it's not gonna be very much recognition and it's gonna be very new and yeah, but I will take that path and it's not gonna be from within, but it's gonna be a completely different approach. That's, uh, I really took this moment to reflect in which, which path, path did I want to take? And that was my decision. But it's true that when I went, I, in the beginning, beginning, my main objective was to get to understand myself better and to get to understand my own suffering and, and transform it more than to help others. I, I really wow. felt I care for myself because the education we have, uh, cultural, familiar, and in the school, there are parts of it that bring a lot of suffering in us. It's not- Like, uh, like, what, like what, could you, could, you, could you give an illustration even for yourself? For or, example, or for others. so many hours in the school and there is this program, fixed program, and there is only one adult that has this pressure to bring you this program and it has not so much time and it doesn't, it, there is no enough adults for the child's need of presence of, for example, maybe my need is more like different than learning maths in a moment that maybe in my family there is a crisis and I need to cry, for example, or I need to express my feelings or my confusion, but the teacher cannot actually uh, be there for you because he has a complete different approach. Like you need to learn these things. There is so many children and there is no much time. So there are many times that my needs and many children's needs are not really the ones that the, ch the teacher or the family can offer because they need to go to work or because they are in a crisis. Or... So I had inside myself many needs that were not met, M many true needs. Or maybe I needed to learn a lot about English, but in my school, they wanted to, to do French. And in that moment, uh, or maybe I needed to, to walk a lot and to take a lot of energy and speak a lot, but I needed to be sitting down and listening. So I, I, I think the point I just want to bring up here is to, to come in is that what is also crucial is that, that kind of, um, first of all, we're not there's no kind of necessary blaming here it's just like there's people the teachers themselves are within a system and it's understandable but the consequence is often that there is quite a lot of suffering that sort of gets kind of i don't know if to, but pushed down it doesn't it to be clear here, i think it's going to be important in this whole discussion suffering will arise for human beings we can do things that have less suffering but the point is it doesn't get to be expressed it doesn't get to be processed that's crucial. And what you were then saying for your own life is what you realized at the beginning of your journey when you were 18, 19, was that you had quite a lot of suffering of your own that you needed to kind of work with and uh, transform. And that's an ongoing process in all of our lives. But for you, you saw that before you could really begin uh, really on this path of creating something, a new, uh, whatever it was you wanted to create in terms of educating children or supporting their development. So maybe just, just so that happened just for a moment, we can come back to that later, but you went through that process to some extent, of course it's ongoing, 
But what, where, where was the beginning of your journey in terms of actually then in the kind of education? I mean, I think you've talked to you in the past, you went to Ecuador or other things, but tell me a little bit about that. What, how old were you and what were you, what, what was the kind of first end step after you'd done this, some degree of this kind of inner cleaning, inner transformation? Yeah, you are right. It's an ongoing thing. And you are right also. What I want to say that it's very important for me is that conscious parenting is a path of self-healing and transformation. It's a very important thing, more than even a technique or even it's something that helps you to heal yourself and to relate to others in a way that you can bring healing to others and you can bring really a, a possibility to be themselves and to develop and to be truly well-being and true happiness happening into other people. So it is a path of a lot of inner growth and transformation. So uh, what happened is that for me, it's like if I had inside of me a big seed that wanted to grow, but I could not find the, the, nourish, the nourishing... Nutrients. Because I was in India, I was with Tibetan people, I was in different projects in Europe, and I could feel that it was not what I was looking for. I did learn a lot of things from everyone, but there was a part of me that was like, this is not it, this is not it. This is not what I'm looking for. For example, if I see all the children in a school uh, dancing traditional uh, dances and, and doing all these things, I see it's very beautiful, it's really nice. And I think it's very important that we learn our dances also, it's good. But it's not what I'm really looking for. There is something else that it's not a conditioning from outside, like uh, putting transmission of my own way of understanding the world. And this is something that you see in education all the time. If it's uh, when I was around 14 years old uh, in history, I could do a work. I could choose any subject. And of course, I choose education how Franco was educating in the school, in the time of Franco, in the time of like the, the dictator. And I was speaking with all people, I was getting a lot of uh, information and I could see the, the difference, how he educated and then how Republicans wanted to educate. It was completely different. Everyone wanted to educate uh, how they think it's good how they think is their belief and they want they to they want to transmit it to the children and i did a big job with that uh, of comparison of interviews and getting material and it was uh, finally i even was invited to a place to to show why, what was my research in in a place where everyone was adult and i was showing my research there because i was passionate with that uh, work i really enjoyed a lot and then I realized everyone is trying to transmit what they are, what they believe is good, what they believe is their truth. But I want to do something different. And no matter how beautiful my truth is, this is not what I want to do. I want to give this being that is new, that has arrived to this earth through me or through another family, the chance to be thinking and believing and, and developing his or her own truth. And... And I don't want to repeat and transmit. I want to give the chance to be really himself or herself and to choose her or his own way. And that's something that I didn't see it so much. There is a lot of very good, very bad. This is the right path. This is what you have to do. Uh, I saw it in every place. Or yeah, even in the jungle, of course, I did learn a lot from, from the people in the jungle. But, just, to wait, uh, to, to, just to say here, so during this period, this is your early 20s or mid 20s. This is a point you traveled around. You traveled to India, you traveled around Europe and you were staying in, in different communities. So often communal living, but also educational communities, uh, trying them out, essentially looking for what would inspire you in this kind of like you were in, in a, you know, you were kind of in a period of, of, of wandering and curiosity to see, to try and find as it were a teacher or a te techniques that were useful. And what I'm hearing you're saying is that you, you saw much that was of value. You saw much that was beautiful, but fundamentally you saw ironically, even in what were probably quite, I understand were quite alternative environments. You were in often quite alternative places. I mean, you could speak, we could speak more about that in another episode, but the point was you still saw this seed, which is there's this way 
and we're going to transmit it to to children and that while in a sense your way is a way it's a kind of met it's a level down which is what you wanted to enable was children to kind of discover their genius in the general sense of genius like are oh, their contribution or and their path and their views um in a way um we could talk more about that because there is a sense of children so just to say though maybe what were the things if there was no one and obviously you've come to develop your own technique what were some of the ones that were most positive or most inspiring to you the top one two or three things that you really learned from and and, and which really have touched you and, it, and maybe many of them have but what were one or two of the techniques or, or or people or schools or or environments you went to that did really yeah after a lot of traveling and a lot of searching and i was a bit frustrated when i was around 24 years old i had been like from 18 to 24 really searching and and then I was kind of giving up a little bit, saying, okay, I don't know if I need to go to Africa, somewhere really far away, but I'm not sure if I have the energy anymore. I wanted to be a mother already, and I still could not grasp what I was looking for. And then I learned about this, this project in Ecuador called Pestalozzi, that Rebecca and Mauricio Wild uh, were uh, running it. And I was completely touched. I only heard a couple of sentences and my heart was so happy. I knew that it was something completely new that I needed my whole life to truly understand it. I read the book and then I went there straight away to kind of go straight into the fountain. I was already pregnant for or three months pregnant. like, uh, And that's why I went so fast because I really, really needed to go straight into the fountain. Then I went back there after with my children. And that would be the, the place where they open up the path that it has given me a lot, a lot of inspiration. And of course, uh, and, and of course uh, um, I, I have had to learn by myself with my own experience uh, and I have developed my own uh, space. Tell me a bit I about them. So maybe people won't know, but so Maritza and Rebecca Wild. They were based in Ecuador and they ran this school, the Petzalots, Bestalozzi School. I mean, they're now, I think both of them have passed or certainly I think Mauricio has passed away. But this oh. was this was in the 80s. Is that right? Or the 90s that you went? Uh, you know how bad I am in. in well, in... rough. OK, but it was. A, so you went <laughs> and, and, well, and tell me a bit about it. So when you went there, where was the school and what, what was it that in what was actually happening? D describe a little bit, actually, the story of like. You went there and what, what was going on in the school and what was what was it that you that, that inspired you? Well, for example, the relationship between the adults and the children was totally different to a conventional school. Like the children were their own. Oh, just, just, just for a second, where was the school? So you arrived. Just tell me a bit about your three months pregnant or whatever. You get to Ecuador and, and where was it in Ecuador? In the jungle or in the... It was on top of a mountain surrounded by nature. That was the first thing, like... If you really realize that human beings, we need nature, we need to have, especially everyone, but even children, they need to be able to, to walk, to run, to experiment, to have trees, to have mountains. And the place was beautiful on top of a mountain, surrounded by nature. And the, the main, uh, who is taking care of their own development is, is each child of themselves. Oh, like, it's not the adult telling the child, now you're going to learn this, after you're going to learn that. But they give, they bring a, they understand, they try to understand every day. They put a lot of emphasis and they do their best to understand what do the child need and how can I create an environment that the children can take what they need. But I don't tell the child what to do. And there is, for one side, the emotional base that the adult needs to give. Like the adults were present, the adults were like, very silent, but very, very clear that I'm here for you. And the children were full of life going, some of them playing music, some of them doing uh, arts, some of them doing maths, some of them doing, it was incredible. The amount of life and work and the children would not stop learning all day, maybe cooking, but then the adults would also help them if they were feeling sad or if they were feeling that something wasn't fair. 
Uh, also, the, the adults who are there to remain that after using something, we have to bring it back to its place. We don't use things in a way that we could break them. So they would create a safe environment too. So that was really what I had been looking for. And I had to also learn my own path, but I did took a lot of aspiration from them. And then this school stopped and they uh, began a community. And what they realized is that it was the family who had more impact on the child's growth. And that's what they changed their mind. And instead of taking care of the children themselves, they took care to transmit to the families how to be with their children. So for me, those are the most amazing fountains that I could find, the, the, the school and the community. I think that's a really important point also to both in your journey and in even this, this episode today, which is um, in, in, a way, in a way in our society, we often focus on education because it is something that sort of it's collectively provided, the state provides, you, you send people to school. With that insight of the wilds, which is what you're saying, they actually even stopped their school in a way and started a community was because of what you're, what you're saying. I think it's one that's also really inspired you is the insight that in fact, the really biggest, most important influence on the child is the parents. I mean, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, but it's not the school. And that if, and, and even perhaps more importantly, my sense from was that they, they saw was that without working with the parents, if you don't have parents who are, uh, let's say conscious parenting, you're not going to have conscious education. You, you can't, you, you, you kind of, that, that without that foundation, you can't build this other thing. So that obviously really influenced your past. So let's come and talk a little bit about conscious parenting and you said how like the school was different um and obviously you know you you also brought just to be clear you've brought up two children in this in this kind of method and learned a lot how let's say we were coming now and i you know i'm 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 a i'm someone who's considering conscious parenting with my children or i want to teach someone else share about it with someone else could you explain like maybe we just start with a concrete example of of what it would look like what does that mean so let's say you know uh, my son is nearly three years old and i don't know let we could pick some area um like he doesn't he doesn't want to have his bath tonight you know he 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 normally has his bath but he wants to keep playing and it's bath time how does one what does it mean like in that circumstance what is a conscious parenting approach with him and maybe also what's not a conscious parenting approach you know what's a, a classic approach and maybe you can just share from or, or other examples you have from your own experience where you've been involved in coaching i think that would help listeners really be like okay before we get into the ideas of it or the theory in a way of it what does it look like concretely like you described coming to that school and it's on a mountain and the way the children are getting to operate which is very you know there aren't structured lessons and everyone is doing maths right now instead people are allowed to discover what they need and then but there is also a structure around it so what does that look like for conscious parenting in in an example uh for me something that i learned is that there are two different roles that the adult has one is to take care of the child and the other is to give enough a space if you overprotect the child a lot he cannot really grow and you create a dependence uh, but if you don't take enough care of the child, he feels kind of abandoned and insecure. And, and for me, it was a big thing to learn because for me, freedom was like the main, most important thing. But then you give so much freedom that the child is kind of overloaded and sometimes dirty, tired, sometimes lost, sometimes. And I had to get to this, this kind of balance between taking care and giving enough freedom. And then taking care would be, we wake up in the morning and sometimes the child just in the morning when he wakes up, uh, it can be that he's not so comfortable in his body. It, it can be that he, even a baby or a child wakes up really happy and starts experimenting with the boys or jumping up and down and doing things and being quiet and well. But sometimes it wakes up kind of uh, in a bad mood and you want to give breakfast, but it's not really like eating and it's complaining. And then it's like, 
okay, so now it's the time to take care. So, oh, I see that you are not feeling very happy this morning and you don't know what to eat. Maybe he would eat if you give like crisp, uh, like cereals with chocolate, but maybe if you give like something more healthy, it's like, ah, oh, complaining, I want only chocolate. So I do listen. So this is a way to really take care of uh, a child that you're not really doing anything very concrete, but it's really to give a space to the complaining, to the not being well, and then, okay, and yeah, and then after maybe it says, oh, my belly is a bit sick, ah, so your belly is not good. And we give a space to this moment that sometimes is not feeling good with presence, with no pressure. And it's like, okay, I'm gonna put some apple here and some yogurt here. And if you are hungry, you can take it. So it's also about not being in a hurry, not pushing too much, not taking the easy path of the chocolate or something like that. And then maybe the child, after being very well listened to it and that you've been giving some time, maybe he feels a bit better. He has been able to express and, and then he eats the, the apple and the yogurt and all that. And then maybe you need to remind him that when we eat, after eating, we clean ourselves, we let the table. Maybe you don't need to remind it because he already knows it, but that would be your, as an adult, something to do with love or respect, but also with, it's like this. It's not only like complete freedom, you eat wherever you want, you leave the apple half eaten in the middle of the room. No, it's like we have a moment, we have a place, we have a way to finish it, to take care of things, to take care of you. Then it's time to maybe uh, dress ourselves. Just, just to check, so just because I think this is quite, and it's great if one time we can even, maybe we'll get to act it out, but just to think, if you're li if you're listening, so what were it when you say you take care of it? There's this lot. This is what you're saying is it's walking this line even there. So the child has come. Maybe they're grumpy. I can well imagine my own son. It's a morning, and they um they don't feel so good, and they don't want to eat what the kind of maybe the normal or even the healthy stuff they've got. And there's this line which is you don't give in. But we also don't use force. We don't like, you're going to eat that apple now. There's a kind of like, and, and just to be clear, even if we wouldn't say that, there's some of those ways we're being that way. But instead, there's a kind of, there's a firmness. We're not like, here you have the chocolate cereal. Oh, you don't want that. Okay, well, here you go. We don't, there's a not giving in. And at the same time, there's a lot of presence. And when you're saying that, the presence is both actually being there. So we're not on our phone. We're not preparing something else. We're actually there at the table with the child, giving them presence. And what you're saying is kind of listening to them and would, would you call it like recreating them? So you, the way you spoke there, just to distinguish it, that's something you'd actually say to them. You'd actually be like, oh, I hear you don't feel very well. I hear your feeling. You don't, you, you know, even like, oh, you don't want the apple. I see that. And like, kind of hearing them but not that doesn't mean then doing the thing and what i also hear is you don't keep saying to them no you're going to eat the apple you also don't do that you like re kind of hear them and what you're saying is with that presence often there will be a point where they like actually feel heard they feel uh they're kind of hurt or whatever the up upset they then may well eat the apple and what you're saying though is you continue down that path which is if they then eat the apple and the yogurt then great but then it's like okay you're going to clear your things if that's what they normally do i guess i just want to ask a question here before we go on down the path what happens if it doesn't you know let's say they like no i'm not gonna eat you know they you know they throw the apple on the floor or something like that you know they they act they the kind of uh, the upset gets bigger how how do you deal with it then or let's say they you know i don't know even i can give a real example you know they push you away like go away you know which shows that there's something there maybe how would that how would you go then or they throw in the apple or whatever okay so when you see a child acting like that the first thing that for me is very important is to realize that the child is full of suffering the child is not happy, he's not feeling good and content inside himself. There is something that it's really annoying him inside because when a child is feeling calm, it's really like very cooperative. It's very like everything is it's much easier and it's a very easy thing to be with him or with her. So when a, if a child does that, I would, I would really realize, oh God, this child is full of suffering at this very moment. So when I think that, 
I don't take it personal and compassion can arise. And it's more possible for me to be present, to be firm still and say, wow, I see how angry you are, but I'm going to put the plate away so you cannot throw it anymore. But it's not like you are bad. This is what's happening to you at this very moment. And it's not easy. And what I'm giving you is love, but at the same time, I do put some consequences so you cannot still injure yourself more or hurt uh, or, or, or break other things. So when if something like this happens, the first thing is that they have an alarm on me saying, this child is really suffering now. It's something in his environment that is not quite right. I need to see what it is. I need to see what we need to change. Maybe my relationship with the father was very tense and he went to sleep very like uncomfortable. Maybe he has uh, some other problem. I don't need to be a very deep specialist, but I do know that he is suffering and that my responsibility is to really take care of his suffering. And the first thing is to really make him feel that I'm there for him. If he pushes me, I can say, okay, as long as you don't hurt yourself or you don't break anything, I can be a little bit far away. But I'm not going to be very far away because I know that you are not feeling good and I don't want to leave you alone uh, if you're not feeling good. I want to be here for you. The important thing is like the place where you talk, it has to be a place of understanding and love because if it is a place of rejection, punishing, all what you're going to do is like hurt him more and add more to his suffering. And that's exactly what it's going to make him more, more like uh, more difficult to be with then. So it is, a, it is an art and it is not something that it comes in one minute. Sometimes it takes a, a few years to really mature yourself in a way that you can see the other suffering instead of seeing how uncomfortable it is for me this morning that he throws away the apple, which is that's, not- that, That's it, just to say that that's very important then, which is why, and I'm just gonna speak for myself as a parent and here maybe, and why I think this is, you just said something that the path of conscious parenting is also a path of one's own transformation is that it can be, um, I speak for myself, two things can come up. Yes, I should be really loving to him when he's throwing the apple on the floor, but I can either feel actually deep down his hurt touches my suffering. And often that might show up for me and I speak for myself as like even anger, like, you know, I made all this effort for you for your, you know, I won't say that, but I made all this effort for your breakfast and you're throwing it on the floor. You pick that apple up right now, young man, you know, like this kind of anger and, and stuff or, or even that I can't really be with his suffering in maybe another way when he's upset and I have to be like, I'm going to go away. You know, I'm going to absent myself. And that absencing might not be literally moving, but it might be, I can no longer emotionally be with him. And I think, that is in my experience of this practice what's hardest is that what you just said has a lot of wisdom and i think it's very important as a parent um also and you, you said this to me is to know your kind of limits and to constantly come back to a point you also made which it's not personal he he or she the child is in suffering it's not they're not even if they're saying something to you like you know i've seen it towards me or my partner you sometimes the you know, some will even say, you know, get away from me, you know, go away, daddy, go away, mommy. And it can be feel very hurtful in a way. But to remember, oh, no, he, there is suffering, you know, may, maybe even I've been a cause of that suffering somehow, but there's suffering and this ability to bring presence and love and compassion constantly back into that moment. So what you're saying, coming back, the child's thrown the apple on the floor, we might move things away like uh you know the you know they're not you know going to throw more apple but what but really we maintain we don't make them wrong we don't reject them and it's, but we say oh i really see you've got a lot of suffering i'm going to move these things for the moment if they ask us to move back we might move back but not so far that we can't support them and make sure they don't injure themselves especially um in my experience you're saying certainly under two two and a half years old children in their upset can do now, they can throw themselves on the floor. They can knock themselves. We need to be in a space where we can protect them. Um, so what would happen next? The child, if it goes well and we are there with them and they're angry and they're upset, what, in your experience, what happens? What's the evolution of right. that? The thing is exactly what you said. The main work is the inner work of the adult of taking care of anger because 
anger of the child will try to push your anger up and then you really need to be taking care. So for me, it would be like before the children wakes up, I needed like one hour and a half minimum two, between one hour and two hours to really take care of myself. So when they wake up, I'm already strong enough inside myself. So these emotions do not get over me because that would be a transmission of what I got already. Like someone is angry, I get more angry. As an adult, I can be more strong, stronger. So I can always repeat this circle. If I want to break it and go to something new, that it's like giving compassion, giving a space to the other, but at the same time being an adult and getting my role of uh, protecting the environment and the child and all that, I need to be very, very kind of self-centered. And of course I will lose it many times. And then I will feel guilty, which is normal. This is, but bit by bit, I can learn to be compassionate with myself too. But there are some conditions that will help me a lot is if I'm well rested, if I'm well eat, if I ate healthy enough, if I gave myself enough space to embrace my own suffering when I woke up in the morning. So what I would do, like for me, that was my main job. Take care of myself so I can take care of others. So uh, that was my main job. And some people, they do a main job and then the, the conscious parenting is something else that they have in the plate. And they don't, we don't realize how big is this job. And then we try to do like two big jobs, but thinking that one is not so important and then we want to do it well. And it's not our fault, but it's just too much in our plate. We are tired, we're hurrying up and we want to listen, not to be touched by the other's anger, to be compassionate, to do that thing that that girl in the internet says, to really listen with compassion. And it's not so easy. So we do need to create conditions for us too. And, and this is makes all your life a complete shift because you need time, you need presence for yourself and for those who you love. And that is a complete full job already. So in that case, if the child comes down, it happened to me like after uh, my child being really upset with the food that he wants another thing. And then you say, no, now is not the moment for this other thing. This is what is here. I, as you said very well, I do not push you to eat what I want, but I do offer a few things, not only one thing, but a few things. So you can choose what you want, but they are healthy things, food, food that is good for you, not only food to stop your uh, uneasiness. Like uh, it can be complete, it can be white rice with, uh, with uh, omelet and it can be apple and yogurt and cereals. And you can put that on the table and or avocado, banana, and, and, and rice uh, biscuits and peanut butter. You can put different things like, and he can choose, but this is what it is. And if you're asking me, for example, like a chocolate cake or an ice cream, maybe it's not the moment and I'm not gonna give it to you. And then if you have suffering inside, you can get into a crisis. If you are calm, you're gonna be truly happy with what you have. This is like this, a child is very happy eating only like uh, strawberries from the garden or, or even nothing because when a child is good, it's, it's really like full of energy and joy. But if he has suffering, he's going to be uh, pushing away everything. And then if I answer with compassion bit by bit, he's going to be or she's going to be feeling more and more relaxed, loved, which is the main uh, food that we need that to be understood, loved as we are, not trying to be pushed and condemned or judged. And then we, we, my experience is that after the crisis, I've been there for the child and then the child feels released. And after that, he may eat or not, or go to play or go to, to dress or... So my main point was, this is one aspect of adult, like to be there for the different emotions, to, to put food so he can eat if he or she wants without uh, the you must eat or not that's uh, that's their own thing and and then after there is this other this other role that is creating an environment that is rich with different things so okay. once and we'll come to that so just just let's say on that one because i just want to i will so the next part which we're going to come to next episode is what the creation of the environment so just at that point it's a great point to pause which is so there's 
this we've come to like what happens in a in a in a in a challenge moment or where there's suffering and, and we could talk more about even a full christ we've talked a little bit but we're also going to come next in our next episode this question of how do we create the nourishing environment how do we create the positive uh environment and what what does that mean what are we trying to nourish uh and what is the what are the aspects of that so that's for our next episode tune in for that one thank you very much for day esther and i look forward to our our next recording our next one Thank you. Thank you, Rufus. It's great to talk to you.